a lot of these criminals would get away with it if they weren't so greedy and flashy. Do you know what a whistleblower is and how that case might be affected with everything that's going on in the world? Well, that's what we're going to find out because that's what we're going to ask the lawyer. Hi again, everybody. I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com. And my guest is New Jersey attorney Jason Brown. Jason, how are you today? Good to see you again. Good afternoon. Great to see you as well. So uh, I don't know anybody who knows whistleblower cases better than you. And how are, how are those being affected with everything that's going on in the world these days? Well, the world certainly seems upside down right now. But the integrity of statutes like the False Claims Act is still robustly standing up. And it's standing up thanks to the courage of individuals who know intuitively or actually that things are wrong and have the courage to come forth and blow the whistle. And there's a lot of different things going on and impacts with the zeitgeist of today. And right. I'm using zeitgeist rather than the virus name for a variety <laughs> of reasons. Uh, but one of the things that comes into play is a great deal of whistleblowing law is in the False Claims Act in the Medicare and Medicaid fraud context. Sure. And a lot of times in the past, what was considered an actionable violation with telemedicine, where a doctor would bill for somebody being in the office rather than at home, is now permissible because there is accommodations based upon the current viral conditions going on. Right. But just like the pandemic, there's a pandemic of fraud going on you can imagine the government has passed a stimulus act that calls for trillions of dollars, government money, which is really taxpayer money, right. that's flowing unmonitored, unaccounted into different people and entities. And a lot of that is fraudulent. And it's fraudulent, you can see in the stimulus money where people who are deceased are receiving checks, people cashing it, that doesn't really fall into what we would consider a classical whistleblower. Okay. But then you get into the loans with the SBA, the emergency uh, disaster loans, the EDA loans, they're called. If there's a false certification for that, that may be actionable under the False Claims Act and also something called the PPP. So so we've heard of the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program. How, how does that uh, figure in with all this? Well, it figures in to billions of dollars a year fraud. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it's 10 to $100 billion wow. fraud. First of all, I'm going to ask you, do, do you know the car of choice of the PPP COVID criminal right now? Uh, uh, the car of choice. Well, uh, in the movies, it's always a Ferrari or something like that. So let's go with that. Yeah. That's a great guess. But right now it's a Lamborghini. Oh, OK. I so, was close. <laughs> they have exquisite taste. And I mentioned Lamborghini because over the last few weeks, several individuals were arrested who took PPP money and PPP money, money that's purpose to flow to the employees. And I can break that down in in a second, in a little bit. And instead of using it for the employees and using it for business, they've used it to purchase brand new, wow. really sharp looking Lamborghinis to the detriment of the taxpayer and to the government. And and, and, ahead, and, sorry. and these people were found out because uh, a whistleblower, somebody who uh, worked at the company uh, said, hey, that's not right. Oh, uh, not necessarily whistleblowers in these instances mm -hmm. in the classical false claims act sense, but yes, the government relies on insiders providing different information. And uh, interesting thing, if you ever saw the movie Casino with Robert De Niro, there's something called Cheater's Justice. Huh. And one of the comments he makes is a lot of these criminals would get away with it if they weren't so greedy and flashy. And here, when they're driving around spanking new Lamborghinis, that's what raises the attention of other individuals. When one day they're walking to work, the next day they're driving a brand new car. Uh, the PPP, is designated where they have to, the employer has to certify that the monies will be used and purpose for the business in certain capacities. Uh, one of the capacities which the premium is on is the PPP itself is for payroll. Mm -hmm. And something like 70 plus percent have to be dedicated towards payroll, have to be put in a manner that keeps people employed, doesn't furlough them, and flows to the employee. And what we'll have in December of this year is the second part of the false certification. We already know businesses are using the money improperly. But at the end of the year, when they want to have that loan forgiven, they have to certify that the money was used properly. Ah. And when it's not, that triggers liability under the False Claims Act. And I could also tell you about a very sneaky scheme that some employers are doing, if you're interested. Please do. Okay. There is many employees that are commission-based individuals. And commission-based individuals, they receive a draw from the company, let's say $400 a week. Right. Maybe it could be in some sort of sales position. 
but they are obligated to pay that money back to the company. So the PPP money that was supposed to flow to the employees does initially flow to the employees, but the employer then says, you now owe me that money back. So they're secretively paying the money back to the company. The government will be none the wiser because it will look like money actually went to the employee. And at the end of the day, these loans that were purposed for the employee, all they do is subsidize the employer, which is not what was supposed to happen. And once they certify that it went to the employee, they will be in trouble, we think, under the False Claims Act. Wow, so that uh, it, that feels like they're double dipping in a way. They're, they're not only doing it fraudulently, taking the money fraudulently, but then getting the money back. Yeah, they're double dipping and not just double dipping, it flies under the radar, which is not detectable by the federal government without a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. And really they're keeping employees as indentured servants at this point where the money that was supposed to go for them has to go back to the company. And it's just inherently unfair. When we started, Jason, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the courageous uh, uh, whistleblower. What about it takes courage? What, what, is a, what is a danger for a whistleblower? Well, if done properly, you could try to mitigate the downside risk. If you use the right whistleblower law firm that's been through it quite a bit, you could try to avoid the landmines to make the case successful. But what often happens is, even though there's strident anti-retaliation provisions in the False Claims Act and all the whistleblower statutes, the employer ultimately, when they find out who the whistleblower is, oftentimes tries to take action and tries to discharge and or affect the conditions of employment of that individual. Mm -hmm. But luckily, we've been through it so many times, and from experience, we can work through all the issues and help people plan their parachute while these whistleblower cases, these False Claims Act cases, which could take several years, go on so that you know your options once the case becomes revealed. And I know there's continuity from video to video, but just so people know, under the False Claims Act, the cases are filed under seal, meaning the defendant, the employer, does not know who blew the whistle or even that a whistle has been blown until many years down the line. Oh, wow. and, and there can be uh, monetary compensation for the whistleblower, correct? There can be significant monetary compensation for an individual who does the right thing in the right manner. And that's why it's so critical to blow the whistle the right way. A lot of cases are blown out of the gate because the individual goes to the corporate integrity line and then gets fired or takes a small package and doesn't know what to do next. Or even calls the government first, government investigates it for several years, takes action, you didn't blow the whistle the right way, no compensation. But if you blow the whistle the right way, depending upon what state it is, you might be entitled to even up to 50% of what the government recovers in terms of the fraudulent funds. So you really want to really maximize your upside and work with the firm that's been through the whistleblower process before to maximize your chance of success as well. And it sounds like the right way to do it is to contact a, 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 a whistleblower firm with experience first before you do anything else? Yeah, we, I mean, we strongly encourage people to call us at Brown sure. LLC. I was a former FBI special agent. We handle cases all over the country. We offer free consultations, only paid if we win the case. But even if it's not our firm, you should look to a whistleblower law firm that has a track record of success and has experience in this field, is firms who don't practice this area of law are gonna step on some big landmines and it's gonna jeopardize your case and your livelihood. And, and so, no, and so, so Jason, there's no downside if I contact you first and then say, go through the proper channels of talking to my boss or, or calling the secret 800 number or whatever. It, it, it's more important to contact someone like yourself first? Absolutely, you okay. should speak to a whistleblower law firm first because like our firm is confidential, it's free. We could tell you what your different options are. Sometimes you may want to surreptitiously record what's going on, if permissible in that particular jurisdiction. But if you go to the company first, they may look for a way to paper it so you're the one at fault yeah. and look to put it on you and kick you out of the company and you be the, the fall guy or fall woman. Wow. So and you definitely want to talk to a, a firm that knows how to handle these circumstances. And, and I know you're based in New Jersey, but you handle these kind of cases all over the country? We are fortunate to have cases all over the country. We're licensed in many jurisdictions, and those that we're not, we do a fancy Latin thing called Pro Hoc Vice, work under somebody else's license at no additional expense to the client. 
Lots of, lots of interesting information as usual, Jason. Thank you so much for making some time and helping us out. Thank you. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been New Jersey attorney Jason Brown. If you remember, if you want the best information or you'd like to be able to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, make sure to go to askthelawyers.com. Also, please take a sec to subscribe by hitting the button down below so you'll know about future episodes. Thanks for watching. I'm Rob Rosenthal with Ask the Lawyers.